Welcome back to the second episode of our second season of Bloopers Brigade. I'm your host, Chase Earl, joined as always by Jake Gordon. We're here now closing in on February and still are in a lockout. But earlier this week, we did get a little bit of good news. We had back-to-back meetings by the players, a couple of proposals by each side. That's progress, considering before that, they'd only met one time in the last two months. Yeah, it's a little disappointing, but, you know, I at least there's progress being made. I think they're supposed to meet again this week. Um, so that'll be so. good. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I think, I think this week uh, the next meeting is going to be on non-financial things. So hopefully they can find a little more common ground there. But from what I did read, apparently the universal DH is, is even pretty likely. Yeah. I, I think that's like one of the few things that like, I think both sides almost want that. Uh, it gives the obviously the players benefit from the extra you know position player getting on the roster and, and therefore so and I think fans I mean that's what we want I, I can tell you I was always kind of a fan of the National League and the strategy and bunning and stuff but after like one year of having the DH like during COVID I was like fuck all that like I want I want I want to watch teams mash as much as possible I don't need to see another pitcher hit again yeah exactly and you know it, it definitely helps with the structure of the roster as well. Yeah, um, but moving on to the Braves, Uh, one of the most recent things, the hot story, and it's not really news news, but when Ken Rosenthal talks about it, who's probably the most highly respected insider in the whole sport, talks about Freddie Freeman and the Braves situation potentially, you know, coming to a, a conclusion right when the lockout ends. You know, maybe Freddie signs immediately to use all of his leverage to get max money. Or the Braves make a, a splash trade for a guy like Matt Olson, who he did confirm that uh, we have been in talks with, and we use our leverage. Because if Freddie Freeman signs somewhere else, the Braves are in a bad position. You know, the A's have all the leverage. Anthony Rizzo is the only first baseman on the market that really even makes sense that could even compare or really be a starting caliber for first baseman for the Braves. So they'd be in a terrible position trying to negotiate a trade if Freddie Freeman were to immediately sign with someone else once the lockout ends. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of the things that I was talking about is like if if you're going to do something, if you're going to say, OK, we're moving on from Freddie, you can't let him make the choice because you just lose any and all leverage that you have right now. Yeah, and I didn't even do any research on this at all. Uh, first of all, Matt Olson would be great. I mean, Freddie Freeman, Matt Olson, I wouldn't complain about either of those. Obviously, I think Freddie's the better decision because you don't have to give up top prospects, which is what you're going to have to give up for Matt Olson, I imagine. You know, Pache and Waters, who were your top two prospects last year, would probably have to go in that deal. And then probably more, maybe a Mueller, maybe even more than that. So it would be a lot for two years of Matt Olson. It's much better to just re-sign Freddie Freeman, have him for the next five or six years. He's pretty damn good, I think. But uh, if we got Olson, you know, I could live with that. But if not him, and then if Rizzo somehow signs somewhere else, the Braves, I, I don't see where they go. I mean, there's Kyle Schwarber, but he tried to play first base and look like a dunce out there. That's not that's not really the Braves' way to sign someone who's that big of a liability on defense, especially at a position like first base. Uh, so I haven't really looked too much further than those three guys, but I don't know if if there is anybody that would it would be a huge drop off if they if they didn't get Rizzo, Olson, or Freeman. Yeah, absolutely, and that it, it does kind of concern me a little bit. But at the end of the day, they just won a championship. Alex Anthopoulos has yet to really let us down, unless you. Uh, unless you really take the Tommy, uh, the Tommy Malone deal that hard. But, uh, you know, I, I trust the guy's judgment. I think the Braves won't be in that bad of a position going into 2022. No, I mean, even without Freeman, they're not in a bad position. I mean, look, they just won a championship without Ronald Acuna. They could do it without Freeman, too, as much as people don't want to, you know, imagine that. But it, it's just something I, – I just – I don't know. That's just something that I just feel like it has to get a deal done. Like nothing else makes sense. It's almost like when I talk about Dansby Swanson and I keep thinking about different shortstop options, man, there's just one option that's just sitting there right in front of you. That's like, yo, just sign this dude. And I know the money. I mean, you look at Liberty Media bringing in worth 17.2 million between Formula One and uh, the Braves and some other uh, sports ventures. They obviously have a booming business like their uh, financials are made public. Like they're making shit tons of money. They just want a world series. Like, come on, let's get this shit done. Um, but uh, who knows? I mean, I, I did talk about this, you know, maybe in an article. I think the reason the, the sixth year is such a big deal with Freeman is because if you look at 2027, I believe 
that's when shit starts to get really murky. That's when your Ian Andersons, your Ozzy Albies, Ronald Acuna's, and all those guys become free agents. So having to pay a 38-year-old Freeman $35 million is definitely going to prevent you from signing an Austin Riley when that when his contract's up or, or extending Ozzy Albies or Ronald Acuna. So I think that's kind of a big deal between that fifth and sixth year. Yeah, and I, I know – Alex Anthopoulos is working within its budget, but it would just be nice to where it would become like a thing with the Dodgers where money is no object and we want to win. And so we don't have to worry about those types of things, but I'm not making those calls. Yeah, I, it does suck. And it just like, it's never going to happen because how are you like, we have the money, like the money is there in their pockets. They just don't want to spend it. Like they have, they have the strict budget and they make Alex Anthopoulos work within that. Uh, we do know payroll is going to go up. So, I mean, we heard Carlos Correa rumors. I don't know. I mean, maybe we'll come out at the lockout ends. We'll get into predictions later, and, and we're just absolutely shocked. What if they do go get Correa and sign Correa and bring in Matt Olson via trade? I mean, that, I think everyone would have they'd to be a better out. team. People don't want to oh, hear yeah. that, but they'd be a much better team. Yeah, well, especially because then you're trading Swanson. I mean, maybe he goes over in the deal with the athletics, but I don't know if he would be so – or maybe – he, but yeah, the athletics uh, trade for Swanson, but I don't really think the athletics are looking for another guy who's going to be a free agent at the end of this year, demanding a hundred mil. That's not their style. They're looking for prospects in a deal for Matt Olson. So uh, you could trade Swanson for more prospects. Who knows? I mean, there's a, t- there's a million ways this could go. I think we're going to be surprised when all this comes. And I think it's going to happen very quickly. Uh, I'm, I, <clears throat> while I would prefer it that way that you said it, I, I'm going to go with the opposite. I think it's going to be resigned Freddie and then like one or two small board things and then it'll be over with. I don't know. I really don't. I, I don't have that much of a read on it, but. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would, I think Correa is shooting like for the stars. I, I, I don't, I would definitely not guess that. I would say I would give that like a three to 5% chance of happening, but I do think we'll be surprised with how much money we end up spending you know, whether we get Freeman or not, they're going to spend money. I mean, it, it, yeah. as bad as we talk about payroll, it's gone up every year, except for like the COVID year. And after a World Series and with revenues back, fans back in the seats, like I wouldn't be surprised if we set a, a record for a budget or for payroll by 20, 30 million. I really wouldn't. Yeah, and I mean, the Braves, they they were the best in the league in attendance last year. I think they might have been second behind the Dodgers before it, when, it all, uh, when it all shook out. But I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they were first in attendance this year. Yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll get into predictions at the end of this uh, episode. But one thing I wanted to talk about is this picture I found on Twitter, which if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to share with you guys. Let's see. Let's see what we've got here. And it's courtesy of my man Rusty on Twitter. So if, if you're on the podcast, you know, try to envision this. But it's Jorge Soler's blast in Houston. You got some Braves fans standing up behind the dugout. You got the whole team going crazy. And then there's a circle around this dude just sitting in the back in the back of the dugout, face forward, looking looking like he's about to run through a wall. Personally, and it's Max Fried, who was the starting pitcher that day, obviously. And it just shows you this guy's an absolute junkyard dog. This is why he's my favorite Braves player. Uh, he's the most competitive player on the team in my mind. At least he, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. He was so focused. He knew the job wasn't done. It kind of reminds you of, hey, and this is Kobe day. It kind of reminds you of a little bit of Kobe Bryant, uh, that kind of competitive nature. And it, it encapul- encapsulates it so well, this this picture after such a big moment where he's just like, hey, man, job's not done. You know, we got we got seven more innings to finish. He goes out and throws six shutout innings the rest of the way, and the rest is history. I, I just think that's a really, really cool picture. Yeah, <laughs> you said it all, man. No, that's the thing, man, is uh, maybe maybe if Max Fried's ankle never gets stepped on, we, we never win the World Series. I guess we'll never know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, and that's true. That even came after the whole Max Fried's ankle uh, stepped on. But, yeah, uh, the, last, the thing that I want to talk about most, though, in this episode is the Hall of Fame debacle. I know everyone's been talking about it. And we can get into Andrew Jones, but I just want to know your opinions on how the hell a man like David Ortiz gets into the uh, gets into the Hall of Fame after testing positive for PEDs and guys like Barry Bond in the first ballot, mind you, first ballot Hall of Famer David Ortiz after testing positive in 2003 went up to that point when, when he had tested positive. I think he had like 50 career home runs and it never had 20 more in a season. Well, then he goes to Boston, and he starts dropping 30, 40, 50. And he never tests positive again, which is, I guess, why people think he wasn't doing PEDs. But that's just a bunch of nonsense, if you ask me. That's just a crazy thing to think. Yeah, and my thing is, like, I, I get it. 
like David Ortiz, great player. He did test positive for PEDs. Uh, but he's real buddy buddy with the media. He's very outgoing. He probably has good relationships with a lot of these guys. I, you know, I I, I will indulge you for this uh for the sake of this podcast, but I've made it clear a bunch of times I don't care about the MLB Hall of Fame anymore. It's actually a joke. Like it's a museum and it's a stupid museum voted on by old guys. Like I really just don't care anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely getting there with me. I just feel bad for the players. Like, personally, I don't give a shit. I mean, it doesn't affect my life whatsoever. But uh, there's just so many – it just doesn't even make any sense. It's like if you like the guy, he gets in. If you don't like him, he don't get, doesn't get in. I mean, Kurt Schilling never used droids, but he has conservative views, like ultra-conservative views. Oh, now now he's going down in Hall of Fame. Booming. The guy has over 3,000 strikeouts. I'm pretty sure, like, everyone who has 3,000 strikeouts is, like, in the Hall. He has like a career three ERA. He's won a World Series. He 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 finished top five in the Cy Young five times, seven time All Star or something. Like that. I mean, he's an obvious Hall of Famer, you know. But he has conservative views. Guy doesn't get in. Jeff Kent, another guy that you know wasn't really buddy buddy with the media, probably should be a Hall of Famer. Might never get in because of that. Uh, obviously, A Rod. A Rod will never get in. A Rod's may, maybe the best shortstop of all time. Not gonna get in. Not gonna get in the Hall of Fame. And obviously, the Roids have to do with that. But Roids matter sometimes. Roids don't matter other times. It's just a a crazy, crazy, crazy thing um, that just blows my mind. Because, I mean, Big Poppy, he doesn't even have – Fred McGriff and Big Poppy have, like, identical numbers. One didn't test positive for PEDs, and one's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it just doesn't even make any sense. Exactly. That's that's really why I just really try. Like, I, I don't let myself get worked up over it. But my thing is, too, like, I, I think it was Ian Happ. Who, I think he, he might be a free agent, but plays for the Cubs. He said, if you have 10 years of MLB service time, like you should get a ballot. I could not agree more with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think something has to be done. I don't, and nothing ever will be done. I feel like this is just an old time tradition that's just terrible that they just need to fix, but I don't think they ever will, you know, because there's, I don't know. They don't, the writers, I, I don't know why they even have writers voting for it. It's just a weird, it's weird to me. The whole process is weird. It's like these gatekeepers that, and then you have guys turning in empty ballots left and right. It's just like, what, what the hell is going on? Uh, we did have the biggest. They, get, they get off on that stuff, man. That's why, like, I just don't, I don't pay it any mind because those old dudes, they just get off on people being mad at them about their ballots. Like, they yeah, love that. They them, I guess up. it makes them feel special. Like, oh, I, you know, you're not worthy of my Hall of Fame. It's like, dude. Exactly. It's exactly what it is. When's the last time you played baseball, bro? Uh, but we had a lot of Braves on the ballot. Gary Sheffield, Tim Hudson, uh, most importantly, Andrew Jones, who we'll get into. Uh, Sheffield, who also tested positive for BDs, I think he stayed right about 40%. So it looks like he's unlikely that he'll probably get in. I think Hudson. I think him and, I think him and Andrew were both 49 or something like that. Andrew was 41.1. And then Sheffield, oh, okay. I think, was 40.6, if I remember correctly. But it just I think Sheffield's further along, and I think he might have gone down yeah. this year, um, which is a bad sign for him, his chances of getting in. Hudson, Teixeira, two other uh, former Braves, they went um, down. I think they are below 5%, so they'll be off the ballot. They're not getting in the Hall of Fame. Kind of bad for Huddy. I always loved Huddy, but I, do I think he's a Hall of Famer? No. Joe Nathan was below 5% too, and that was a joke. Uh, Billy Wagner, uh, I think he's up to like 30-something percent. I think Billy Wagner's got a chance of getting in. Um, but I just don't know why, is, like, yeah. I mean, I just don't know why it has to be like this gradual. Like, that's a no-brainer to me. Billy Wagner's like, what, third all-time in saves? What yeah, but if, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, man. It doesn't make any sense. But uh, Andrew Jones is the big one. I think everyone can agree. He's the best defensive center fielder of all time. Maybe the best defensive player at any position of all time. Probably the best defensive player of any position. He also smacked 440 homers, most of which came in a 10-year span, won 10 straight gold gloves. And one thing that I, when I was writing the Andrew Jones article about him being in the Hall of Fame, I didn't realize from... 1991 to 2005, when the Braves won 14 straight division titles, the the guy who led the season and war the most, he had five seasons where he led the team and war, was Andrew Jones. No one, no other Brave had more than two, and I think that was Maddox, maybe. Chipper Jones only had one. So you're talking about, like, from a war perspective, he was the best player on the team of the 90s, best center fielder in baseball, and the best defensive player of all time. And he's not – and he's now on his fifth ballot and has not gotten in. Hasn't even gotten fifty percent of the votes. Yeah, and like it's seriously, if if you don't think Andrew Jones belongs in the Hall of Fame, which if you're if you're listening to this podcast, I'd venture to say that's probably not the case. But if you're talking about things like batting average, you're really telling on yourself. 
That's all I got to say about that. Yeah, so I saw some people being like, oh, he has a 250 batting average. And I'm like, bro, he also has a career 840 OPS. And that includes the last four years of his career where he legit was like hitting like shit, you know, like where he hit 152 with the Dodgers. Um, but the good news is 41.1% is up 35% from where he was four years ago. So he's climbing. I, I think, you know, by the time he's on his 10th year, I mean, we saw Larry Walker make big jumps. A lot of guys make big jumps in those later years. I think he'll definitely get in, but uh, he should already be in after five years, in my my opinion. So so to the to the best part of this episode, we're going to do some predictions, just kind of going through some things um, once the lockout ends. First of all, when do you think the lockout ends? Let's start with that. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're going to put me on the spot for this first one. Um, let's say I'm, not, I'm actually going to, I'm going to pick, I'm, I'm going to pick a date just in case I'm right. I'm going to pick a date. I'm going to go February 18th. February 18th. All right. So are, are we doing just completely a made where, that up? Are we doing a thing where like you can't go over or you can't go like if it goes past your date, you automatically lose. Yeah, go high or low. Yeah, I'll say February 18th. No, I'm calling it on the nose. It's going to be February 18th. All right, I'll go. What is it today? It's it's January 20th. I'm going to go February. I'm going to go February 11th, a week before you. I, I think things will kind of are starting to turn around. I think once they get in the room like three or four times a week, like it looks like they're trying to do, I think we'll, we'll get a deal done. And I think anything past that point, you know, because you still have free agency. Uh, pitchers and catchers are supposed to report around the 21st, I believe, 20th, 21st. And then you have your first spring training game on the 27th. So anything past like early February, I think you're really, you're going to have to either cancel games, move back the season, blah, 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 which is something I, I think they want to avoid. And it looks like they're trying to avoid, which is why they're meeting, you know, multiple times in a week. So I'll go February 11th. It would be um, hilarious if like we just, it cut to like June 1st. Well, I mean, it would be hilarious, but like June 1st, like we're like, oh, yeah, it'll be like two or three weeks. And yeah, it'll be like, still yeah. nothing. I, I definitely think we're optimistic, but you have to be. I mean, I, I, I mean, it would make me sick if it went any further than that because it just, it's just kind of, a, I think this is a ridiculous, you know, bi- millionaires and billionaires arguing about dollars is always just a turn off to any fan. Yeah. Um. So let's go, let's see, what, what do we want to do next? Um, Let's do free agents the Braves sign, including their own. So free agents that they sign once the lockout ends. I, I got to like remind myself. So Eddie Rosario is still available. Jorge Soler is still available, which I don't think is going to happen yeah. with the Ozuna Pretty news. Pretty much everyone, all of our free agents are available. <laughs> Jock we- Peterson. Uh, I think they'll get Rosie and Freddie Freeman back. I'll go Freeman and Soler. And that might be uh, wishful yeah. thinking, but I just am imagining a lineup with a DH. I know that means like Soler or Azuna playing left field. But if you remember last year, I know it was like short. I think Azuna was only there for like, what, 30 or 40 games. He actually wasn't terrible playing left field. Like I think he was actually had a positive war defensively. I don't think that's sustainable, but I think he can be just like an okay left fielder. Okay enough to keep him out there. And I'm just imagining that lineup with Ozuna and Soler and Freddie Freeman, and uh, Duvall, and Austin Riley. And I'm just like, damn, they're legit going to hit 300 homers. Like, there's no way that that lineup doesn't hit 300 homers. And I, that's just too tantalizing to me. As long as Soler doesn't go out there and get 50 mil, if he stays around the 30 mil range over two or three years, I, I think that, I think that's that's the move right there, Soler and Freeman. I'd, I'd be happy either way. I don't know. They might – I don't think they'll add another bullpen guy. Um Rosario, yeah. Did... Rosario is safer. He's the safer of the two. I just think the upside you get, like by a potential forty home run season from Soler, and if you think what he did last year, because if you remember, like a- Alex Anthopoulos brought in Soler as a bench bat, and then Walt Weiss went up to him and said, "Hey, man, we got more than a bench bat here. Like, check out this tape. They fixed a couple things. All of a sudden, he's one of the toughest outs in the ba- in the majors. He's taking his walks." He's hitting for a decent average, and obviously the power is there. So if they think that that's sustainable, if they think they found something in his swing, that upside is just too much for me to pass up. And that's why I think they could go with him over Rosario, even though Rosario is Mr. Consistent. He'll, he's going to give whoever he plays for an 800 OPS next year. I'd almost guarantee it. sucks because I want all these guys back. Like, I want Jock back. I know it's not going to happen, but 
you know, it's 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 wishful thinking. I would love to have Jock Peterson back. Um, I would love to have Rosario and Soler, all of them back. But it, you know, even without you know, even without Marcelo Zuna, you have to consider this. Those moves were made because of the injuries to Ronald Acuna and you know Adam Duvall coming back. Like that's just that's just way too many guys. Uh, especially, I mean, Rosario can probably play infield. I think he has played infield before, but it's probably just not going to happen. Yeah, the outfield, though, is a need. I mean, there's no way we can go in there thinking that Christian Pass or Drew Waters can contribute next year. In my mind, those guys need a whole year in AAA. Like, if Pache starts dominating, maybe we call him up. But we have to have at least one more outfielder because right now, Azuna, Duvall are the only two guys we know are going to be there on opening day with Acuna being injured, and we still need a DH. So I think getting another outfielder that, that can also potentially DH is a must. Like, that has to happen. That's not like a... Oh, like a luxury. Like, no, we have to get at least one more because we saw what a mess we had last year when we relied on Christian Pass to begin the year. Um, yeah, definitely. So here's a, this is one that you, that you brought up. Uh, a, guy, a prospect that you see being traded, should we say before the start? Yeah, before, let's do before the start of the season, not, not throughout the year, before the start of the season. That means we're going to make a trade, which isn't a guarantee. But let's say we do. I think William Contreras is just the easy choice. I don't know what his value is. I don't know what his market is. But, I mean, even like right before the lockout, we were talking about it. Like the Orioles and the Pirates, neither one of them had a catcher on a 50-man roster or the 40-man roster. And he is the perfect young, talented player that they would be looking for, um, you know, to step in. That's played a little bit in the MLB. Maybe they can groom like a little bit in AAA before the season. Uh, but that high upside play, I think that's somebody they'd be interested in. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm going to say the same thing, but I'll try, I'll mix it up. But yeah, with with Manny Pena getting signed, not just for a one year deal, a two year deal, you also have two more years of Darnode. I, I don't see how William Contreras doesn't get moved because Langoliers is the guy. Uh, if we don't go get Manny Pena, I think William Contreras is one of the most untradeable prospects in the system. But when you go get Manny Pena, uh, it looks like the Braves, I'm not, I don't want to say they gave up on Contreras, but they don't view him seriously as a catcher. Because he's he's played at some time in the majors. He's looked pretty good. He looked really good when he went back as a hitter in Gwinnett. I have a feeling it might be a defensive thing that kind of turned them off. He didn't look great defensively when he was in Atlanta. And maybe they kind of just are like, yeah, he's not really a catcher, um, at least in our system. So I think that's why they went out and got Manny Pena. And I definitely think he's the top trade candidate. But I'll go with someone else. Uh, and it's probably it's going to be a pitcher because we do have a lot of pitchers. And I'm going to go with I'll go with Kyle Muller. I still don't know what Kyle Muller is. He he's got he's got this like top five prospect, you know, by his name. I don't really know if he is a top five prospect. I thought he looked good, you know, on his tape. You know, he looks like he has a lot of potential. He he built up some good value, uh, but I don't know where he stands kind of in the big picture of this Braves organization as a starting pitcher. Uh, when I was doing my roster, you know, predictions for four or five years down the road, three, four, five years, I had him in the bullpen. I think right now, unless he develops a third offering and gets better with his control, he's more of a bullpen arm. And if you're think if that's what you're thought of him, you know, you might as well sell high on him now while he's a top five prospect in your organization. So I'll go with Kyle Muller. If not him, I mean, I guess you could go Tucker Davidson. Really, any of those arms you could you 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 could find tradable. But I'll go with Mueller because I think he gives you the most in return. Yeah, and of course, the, the thing is with Contreras going back to what you said, the signing of Pena, it it also just gave him options, like because clearly he's not ready, and so you you don't have to you don't have to rely on him. Like you do have the option, you don't have to trade him, but now you can trade him. So I think that was the most important thing with that. But yeah, Mueller, I agree. Um, but you know, we, we say, you know, he's probably a bullpen piece. There's nothing wrong with having a left hand bullpen piece. that can throw 98 miles an hour. Uh, you know, and it's, he's six foot eight. So he comes halfway to the plate whenever he's throwing, you know, that's like a Rawls Chapman type stuff. So no, not at uh, all. There's nothing wrong. Nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. No, not at all. I think that's fine. And that's why I didn't, I did include guys like Mike Soroka, Drew Waters, even Tucker Davidson. Cause I felt like, you know, they're, they're, likely to be traded at some point i could see drew waters that's another guy we should na name or christian pache if there's a big deal both both of those guys could be out or one of them um with michael harris zooming through the system and i know we both are high on jesse franklin uh the braves have a lot of outfield depth um but speaking of guys i mean look look at prospects you're excited about i mean spencer strider he's probably the guy we might be most excited about next year 
could be a huge piece to the Braves. He's going to be a bullpen guy. I think pretty much everyone's already like decided he's a bullpen guy. He throws, he's touching a hundred. Um, so there's nothing wrong with a guy that that's just strict bullpen piece. The Braves need some of those, especially when you think about it soon at Matzik mentor, you know, they're going to be free agents. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The last prediction I want to give you. So we're, we're talking trades here. Who's the most likely the Braves trade for, or maybe just a guy you'd like to see the Braves go after. Um, we already talked about Matt Olson, so I'll switch it up. Uh, Brian Reynolds. I mean, I've been on the Brian Reynolds train for a year and a half now, maybe. I mean, it's been a long time. Um, the guy, I mean, he's incredible. And he has like four or five years of team control left, only 26, already an all-star. Hit 300 with like a, like a 900 OPS. Hits doubles, triples, uh, home runs, steals bases, plays great defense. You're talking about adding a bona fide superstar to, to the outfield from a team with the Pirates that just frankly has no direction. They're probably not going to be very good. And so that's probably somebody that I would be willing to give up a lot of prospects for, like if, especially if Freddie Freeman came back and Matt Olson, the whole Matt Olson thing was just put to bed. I think if you make a trade for Brian Reynolds, I mean, Acuna Reynolds, uh, you know, Duvall, maybe even like Solaire, that's a scary outfield. Yeah. I like Reynolds. I like the idea of that if you do that, you're probably kissing away the futures of Drew Waters and Christian Pache. But for a guy like Reynolds, when you already have Acuna, when you actually have Azunia locked up for a couple more years too, you get a DH, all of a sudden you've got the most loaded outfield DH combination you can possibly imagine. I mean, you got three potential all-stars right there, um, plus whoever the Braves get at the DH. So I like that. I'm actually going to go with the starting pitcher because I know the Braves don't need one, but there's a lot of guys – out there that I think they could get for reasonable prices that are on one, two year deals. Sonny Gray is a guy that I've been preaching about. Um, but Frankie Montes out of Oakland, Sean Manea out of Oakland, those, those teams are going to be selling. I have a feeling. And like, like we've talked about, everything's going to happen quickly once this lockout ends. So uh, I, I, could see, yeah, I could see, you know, us making a deal for a pitcher. It's not, it's kind of an, that is a luxury. The Braves don't need a pitcher. Charlie Morton, Ian, Ian Anderson, Max Freed, I'm also still high on Kyle Wright. Then you have guys like Tucker Davidson, Foscar, you know, it's, it's definitely not a need. But if you throw in a Sony Gray at the top of that, you know, good luck. Like, good luck, along with this offense that we could be looking at. And Sony Gray is making like 10 million bucks over the next like two years. So he's a bargain. Um, I just think that would be – even Luis Castillo. I mean, those, those are the kind of guys. You throw one of those guys up there with the rest of the Braves. I mean. Yeah, that is uh, – that's filthy. Uh, that that's going to be probably the favorite to win the World Series if they aren't already. Definitely, definitely. I feel like that's a deal too with Sonny Gray. You could do him and and Reynolds probably, and still hang on to. You know, the, I've said before the only two prospects that I consider untouchable are Michael Harris and Shea Langoliers. And really, if we're really getting down to it, it would probably be just Langoliers. There's not really anybody I'd trade him for just because I think he really does have that JT Real Muto uh, potential. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a short list. It's a short list. Yeah. I mean, I could deal Michael Harris. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't call him untradeable. It'd just take, I agree with you on Langoliers so though. There's probably nothing I would deal him for. We don't have any other, I mean, we have William Contreras. I guess it depends what you feel about Contreras, but I feel like Langoliers is the catcher of the future. He's a guy who could be elite defensively and hit 25 plus homers like Rio Muto, which is just so valuable these days. That's that's such an advantage over every other team at the position. So I'm probably not giving up uh, Langoliers. I could give up Rio Muto, or not Rio Muto, uh, Harris, simply because the Braves have so many outfield options. They have a lot of good major league outfield stuff, and they have Pache Waters, you know, even Yanista, um, Jesse Franklin, guys like that. So. I could give up Harris, but it would have to be a huge deal and uh, something like maybe We're getting We're talking Brian. a superstar. Yeah, getting yeah. Brian Reynolds, though, uh, for Harris, who probably won't be ready for two, two three years, that's, uh, that's something you'd have to consider in my mind. Yeah, definitely, especially if it meant it's just Harris and, like, maybe, like, a pitcher instead of Waters, Pache, you know, Contreras, like, three or four guys like that or four or yeah. five guys like yeah. that, honestly. I mean, one, I mean the Braves – they do need a little bit of depth. Uh, they're really top heavy right now. Their top 10 prospects are probably just as solid as everyone else's. But after that, you know, it's a lot of replenishment. The good news is Alex Anthopoulos looks to have been nailing these drafts. Uh, 
you know, nearly every guy I feel like we've drafted, we're talking about just dominating. I know it's the lower level, the minors, most of them, but I mean, look at Elder, look at Strider. I mean, it's been pretty incredible what these young prospects have done and how they've shot up into the top 10 already. Yeah, that's that's the main thing, too. That's that's what I've been talking about as well. With, you know, I keep saying that's why 18 of their 20 picks were college players. Like, they, these are guys that are going to replenish the system really quickly. Yeah, well, that wraps us up for our second episode of Season 2. Hopefully we'll oh, be back. Oh, wait, hang on. I got one. One oh, second. Got I got one? a good one. Uh, first okay. prospect that has not reached the majors to reach the majors. Oh, so Spencer Strider doesn't count? No, not no Strider, no Mueller. No Davidson. Um, yeah. Shit, I have to like look at a top prospect list. <laughs> I, I, you can do that. Well, I think it's going to be Bryce Elder. I can see Bryce Elder. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, have him, I have him making it this year for sure. He'll make a spot. I, think, I don't think they're going to rush through waters like that, especially with his strikeout rate. I mean, if his strikeout rate improves, then it's definitely possible. But they're not going to call up a guy who's striking out at a 28% clip from Gwinnett just – because unless there's an injury, but I think it's going to be elder. I think he'll make a spot start or something, or he'll throw out of the bullpen and somebody gets hurt. Yeah. I I think it's hard for me to argue. I think that's definitely the right answer when you, but let me, let me look at this. Show me the full list. I'll try to give you another one. Cause it's not going to be someone at the top probably just because a lot of those guys have already been up. Yeah. They're either already been up or they're just like too low. I'm trying to look. Indigo, Indigo Diaz, if he keeps pitching like he is. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a bullpen option, especially if if we don't play well. I just can't yeah. see. I mean, maybe Freddie Tarnock. I could see him making a spot start if he has a good run in AAA to start the season. Um, Braden Shoemaker, yeah. no way. Cusick, too far away. I mean, I'd ha- mm-hmm. I, if I had to go with three, I mean, Elder's the overwhelming favorite to me. Then I'd probably go Tarnock and then probably Waters. Those would probably be yeah. the order I would go. That'd probably be my three as well. Yeah. All right. Well, now you good? Good? We can wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. I'm all done. right. All right. That does wrap <laughs> up uh, episode two of season two. Hopefully next time when we're back, we will have, you know, baseball on the docket. Um, we'll probably be back in a, in a couple of weeks, hopefully, the lo- whenever the lockout ends. But then that could be months. We might not see you for months. So uh, hopefully we're back in a couple weeks. The lockout's over. We're talking about spring training. We're talking about roster battles. We're actually talking about some real informations and not talking about the same storylines we've been talking about for basically the last three months.